welcome. Thank you for making the trek all the way to Westwood. Struggling with um, what I imagine is parking. My understanding is that we're competing with um, Polly, and I believe a basketball game right next door. So apologies um, in advance for that. Let me also welcome those of you who are joining us remotely in this new hybrid world. Uh, we sometimes forget that we have people intently listening and trying to engage and participate um, in little boxes. And so let me do my best to welcome all of you into this space. So um, today, we're really lucky for lots of different reasons. Um, we get to hear from key folks um, about a very important topic. My task is not to introduce the panelists, but rather to introduce one person who will um, then introduce uh, the panel. But I, what I would like to um, talk a little bit about is the role of interdisciplinary studies and how we do things in part uh, at UCLA via multiple spaces, um, including that of downtown Los Angeles, but also Westwood. Um, and these multiple spaces that I just mentioned um, has been ongoing. This is work that we've been doing for well over a decade in downtown, um, clearly, but throughout the rest of Los Angeles um, beyond. And one of um, the most important things um, that I've done, I believe, in my work um, at UCLA um, has been my years when I led the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. And in that role, I got to engage um, with Kent Wong, um, with Larry Frank, with other um, colleagues and scholars in this space um, as we um, e reimagine the relationship, if you will, and the partnership between research, students, and labor. And so I'm very happy that this space provides us with some um, point of discussion to begin um, and to continue um, with this engagement and discussion on our campus. Um, the whole point of um, this speaker series, in part, um, is to bring up some of the most pressing and important ideas of our time and to engage with different thought leaders, and so we'll be doing that today. What I'd like to do real briefly is to um, introduce the chair of the Department of History, Kevin Terraciano, um, who has been at UCLA for almost 31 years, and the reason I know this is that we were hired the same year, and I remember, I think it was in this very space where we had our orientation um, to welcome us to this um, campus. Um, Kevin is now Department Chair of History here at UCLA, and he also is the Robert Burr Endowed Chair of History. It comes with um, being a chair of the department. Um, he is also the senior editor of the Hispanic American Historical Review and co-founder of the Getty Research Institute Florentine Codex Initiative, another, uh, a, new, a special event that will be hosted um, this week. Um, and you might want to say a little bit plug uh, on that, Kevin. Uh, without further ado, um, Professor Teresiano. Thank you so much, Abel. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, yes, I am the chair of the history department. I'm the 21st chair. Um, and according to my records, this is the 21st episode of Why History Matters. Um, so I'm feeling like maybe I should go play some blackjack later or something. <laughs> uh, but um, it was David Myers uh, back in 2011 that um, founded this uh, program, this series. And David now is the director for the center, the Luskin Center for History and Policy, another public-facing center that um, is trying to promote um, this idea of applied history, uh, community engagement, public-facing discourse. Um, because we historians uh, believe that knowing the past is essential um, in order to understand the present and the idea that history can help us make informed fo uh, choices in the future. Um, and um, just uh, looking back at the, the topics um, that have been uh, covered in the past, it's pretty fascinating. Um, we have talked about climate change, about women's rights as human rights, why black women's lives and histories matter, past and future of the Middle East, 
uh, trying to make sense of the 2016 election. Um, still trying to make sense of that one. Um, history in the classroom as controversial. And um, mayors on the future of Los Angeles. We've had a number of programs on LA. Uh, rent control in LA. The future of the LAPD. Um, the past and future of water in LA. Voter access in California, incarceration in California, uh, the slow food movement, perspectives on academic freedom, historical scholarship and social justice, and most recently China, Russia, US, and the legacy of the Cold War. Today, we have a very timely hot topic, America on strike, labor takes center stage. And um, we're happy to be here in person to, to talk about this. The last four Why History Matters meetings were all remote on Zoom. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, Ann Major, assistant to the chair, and Peter Evans of development for helping to organize this. And I'd like to especially thank my colleague, Toby Higby, who's professor of history and labor studies and director of the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. And I will hand the mic over to Toby, who will introduce our special guests today, tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And welcome to everybody here in the room and to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, organized labor, and it is a timely topic. So we're, we're, um, we're going to connect it to history, we're going to talk about the present day, we're going to maybe even talk about the future, because that's one of the things that's so cool about history, studying history, is it connects us to the past and the future. So. Um, you know, in the last year, we've had a kind of remarkable string of labor actions, high-profile strikes that began, uh, well, there was the railroad worker strike and then 40,000 academic workers at the University of California, LAUSD service workers went on strike and the teachers were on strike in solidarity with them. Then the WGA, the Writers Guild of America, and following them, the Screen Actors Guild, still on strike. The Teamsters almost went on strike at UPS. The nurses at Kaiser. The UAW struck against the big three automakers. Uh, and there are uh, hotel workers on strike all over Southern California and Arizona. So we had Striketober last year. We had Labor Spring. Then we had Hot Labor Summer. And people just ran out of things. So now we're just calling it our, stri our strike season, or something like that, yes. So uh, that's what we're going to celebrate today, our strike season. And tonight we have three experts who have uh, observed and participated in labor campaigns, in negotiations, in policy making, especially here in Los Angeles. And we're going to find out what's driving so many people to the picket line, what's happening in the labor movement, and where we might be headed in the future. So joining me here tonight uh, from uh, left to right is Susan Minato. Susan is the co-president of Unite Here Local 11, the union that represents more than 30,000 workers in the hospitality industry in Southern California and Arizona. She is on the executive board of the Arizona AFL-CIO and the County Federation of Labor here in LA. Uh, one of the, how many members are in the County Fed? 850,000 members in the County Federation of Labor. She has a law degree from UCLA, so a Bruin. Go Bruins, we'll be doing an eight clap later. And uh, she's been an organizer and worker advocate for over uh, 30 years. Um, so, uh, and of course, as I mentioned, many of the workers in her union are on strike right now. Next to Susan is Billy Ray. Billy Ray is a screenwriter and the former co-chair of the negotiating committee of the Writers Guild of America. His screenwriting credits include the Oscar-nominated screenplay for Captain Phillips, 
uh, which won the Writers Guild of America Award, and Showtime's The Comey Rule, which he wrote, directed, and executive produced, among many other titles. Along with that, Billy has been the host of a weekly podcast, Strike Talk, about the WGA strike during that recent action. And Billy is also a Bruin, correct? Classic. Double Bruins. Okay, very good. And next to Billy then is my colleague, Kent Wong. Kent has been the director of the UCLA Labor Center for over 32, for 32 years uh, and a core faculty member of the UCLA Labor Studies program. Under his leadership, the Labor Center has become an internationally recognized leader in university-based labor research and education and truly a model for the country uh, and uh, internationally. In fact, I was just reading a grant proposal and uh, the proposal said, we want to be like the Labor Center at UCLA. So there you go. <laughs> Kent is a uh, founding, he was the founding president of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. He's past president of the United Association of Labor Education and is a vice president of the California Federation of Teachers. Where he gets all the time and energy to do that, I don't know. But uh, please join me in welcoming these three panelists. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to try to keep it lively. We're going to start with a lightning round, and then we're going to go around. Uh, everybody's going to say a few things. But so, lightning round, in just a few words, how would you describe how you're feeling about the labor movement's prospects tonight? Susan? Well, I'm feeling super inspired. We're on strike at 60 places, and then, but also feeling like, whoa. We're on strike at 60 places. <laughs> but a lot, a lot of good stuff coming out of it. Excellent. Billy? Um, I, I feel great about where labor is right now. I think labor's having a moment. Um, and I think you're going to see, as, as history moves in cycles, and I'm sure Ken could speak to this, um, I think the cycle that we're about to enter is going to be a very pro-labor cycle. Excellent. OK, Kent, just a few words. I think this is a very exciting time uh, that we are witnessing a resurgence of the American labor movement. And in many ways, Los Angeles is, at, is the focal point of the uh, US labor movement. And I think there's rich lessons from the Los Angeles labor movement that can be shared and spread throughout the country. Great. Well, say a little bit more about that, Kent. Why don't you follow up on, the, on what's been happening over the last 30 years in Los Angeles and what kind of lessons that has for the rest of the country. So Los Angeles historically has not been known as a pro-union town. Uh, in fact, it uh, has a reputation as an anti-union town, and uh, there was a fierce corporate domination of major sectors of the U.S. economy that uh, effectively blocked large-scale unionization. I do, I do think that in the last 30 years, there has been a tremendous resurgence, in part because of the new working class, increasing numbers of uh, Latino API immigrant workers who have helped to revitalize the US labor movement. And the LA labor movement went on record as uh, one of the first in the country to push back on some of the uh, white supremacist nativist views of the U.S. labor movement that refused to acknowledge the extraordinary potential and hope that, in particular, the Latino immigrant working class uh, was presenting to the U.S. labor movement. And so some of the most powerful and dynamic union organizing campaigns, including the extraordinary work of the hotel workers, the justice for janitors, the home care workers, have been led by workers of color, women, and immigrant workers. And so that is really at the core of labor's revitalization and gives hope for the future in terms of the growing numbers of low-wage uh, immigrant workers who are fighting against tremendous exploitation and abuse. Thanks, Ken. So uh, Susan, uh, the hotel workers are on strike. I was down at a, a, a rally at Pershing Square recently. It was massive, super energetic seemed like every hotel worker in the entire city was there. Um, you know, I went to the subway and there were more hotel workers picketing another hotel. Uh, and you told me something like 5,000 people were there. What is it that the hotel workers are, are striking for today? Well, um, 
you know, it's honestly, you'll be surprised when I tell you. It's pretty simple. Um, people right now. Oh, sorry. I, listen. Well, you'll be surprised that what we're fighting for is super simple. And uh, right now, because of housing costs especially, everyone's dollar is devalued. So we're asking for five major things. One, we're asking for about $10 an hour over the period of the contract, the whole contract. Okay, so that's a few dollars each year. Uh, the second thing we're asking for is normal increases in health and welfare to maintain their excellent health care for their families. A, just a little bit of money to increase their pension, to return to staffing levels pre-pandemic. Some of you have heard of shock doctrine that basically, you know, because of the big, big pandemic, uh, there have been a lot of changes primarily that workers are doing two jobs. Uh, and then the last thing, the fifth thing, is that we're asking for growth, meaning that any other future acquired hotel that a company gets, that they offer the, uh, a new, basically a neutral stance for uh, unionization. That's all we're asking for, and 60 hotels are on strike for it. We have just signed four, and so we're hoping to make a big break with you know a chunk of them. Okay, so you know which hotels not to send your friends to. There's a website for that. Uh, okay, Billy, the uh, writers were on strike for months. Um, Tell us about what was driving the writers out and what did they win? Sure. Um, writers historically have taken on the position that when we negotiate with uh, the Alliance, the uh, Alliance of Motion Picture Television, they call themselves producers, but they're actually studios. Um, our position is always we never ask for things that would be good for writers but bad for the business that anything we ask for is going to be good for the business. And in this case, that was exponentially true because this was not a strike that was about fairness, at least from my point of view. I think most people think they're treated unfairly. Um, this, was a, this was a strike that was about extinction. Um, the, the, uh, the idea of making a living, a professional living as a writer, was completely at stake um, based on where the trends were going in our business, would people actually be able to make a living as a writer five years from now, ten years from now? And if they couldn't, um, what happens to the guild? And if the guild goes away, what happens to the business? Um, who's going to write the movies at that point? Um, that's sort of an overview. Specifically, um, what was being discussed had to do with uh, a completely new model, um, which was streaming, and how was that going to be monetized by writers so that writers could share in the, in the exploitation of profits um, in streaming? That was the big money issue. Um, the big PR issue, the big messaging issue from the start was AI. Um, uh, on, on day one of the strike, I remember calling uh, my dear friend Chris Kaiser, uh, who was the co-chair of the negotiating committee. I, I had co-chaired it with him myself. And I said, I know you're going after five different uh, subjects in this contract and you got to win all of them but if you want to win the public to come to your side just talk about AI just talk about people writers being replaced by AI and the public will come with you and the media will come with you and and that essentially is what happened everybody was so terrified by the prospect of that uh, with reason um, you know what SAG is still striking about is AI what's left to negotiate in the SAG deal they've settled on everything They've agreed on the money, they've agreed on everything, but they haven't agreed on the language about AI because right now um, the, the proposal was if you were an extra uh, in a movie and you were going to work 10 days that you could show up on day one, you'd get scanned, they would then reproduce you via AI, and pay you for half a day, and your AI avatar essentially would work for the next nine and a half days and you'd receive nothing. Well, that would, of course, destroy SAG. In the same way, um, we as writers were being faced with the prospect of being rewritten by AI, um, which would have been optimization uh, from a financial point of view and devastation from a point of view of both the art and our guild. And that's essentially, those were the two giant issues for us. Great, yeah, thanks. We'll, we'll definitely get more into the AI issue as we, and, and other technology issues. Um, well, I wanted to ask about kind of the role of economics in the cost of living crisis. LA is a very expensive town, we all know. 
housing was a huge issue in the strike of graduate assistants and sure. academic workers here. It came up in the writer strike. It's coming up in the hotel worker strike. But California has always been really expensive. So I guess a question I have is sort of um, long term, short term, in terms of what people are, the economics of this. Are, are these strikes about the post pandemic readjustment, uh, or are there longer term economic changes uh, and, and tensions that are you know, part of California and American? life that are driving them, or both? I'm, I'm going to try that first, but I, yeah. I have experts on to my right and left, so I won't go on too long. But from the beginning, the reason why I, I personally wanted to do a podcast about the strike was because I felt that the WGA strike was the front line in a much larger struggle about the corporatization of America and the soullessness of, of that movement um, versus the dignity of work and, and the worth of the individual. Um, yeah. It's, it's a big deal if you work in Los Angeles and can't afford to live in Los Angeles. That's a, a giant quality of life issue. That's two hours traveling to and from. That's time that you're not with your kids. Um, yeah, that, that's a problem. And that needs to be addressed. Um, and it was, again, I come back to that word optimization, which is a, a Silicon Valley term. It's a tech term that essentially means that you do whatever you can to lower the cost of labor to increase your profits. And if people get squeezed, tough shit. Um, I, I don't think you can run a business that way uh, if you need to be in partnership with the people that are actually making your product. And part of that is, in the same way that in Silicon Valley, most people who work there can't afford to live there, um, people who make movies need to be able to live near where those movies are made. Um, and, and that's something that was at the core of what we were talking about. Susan, you want to say something about housing and the, yeah. for the hotel workers? Well, I don't actually, I mean, definitely people uh, being without a job for two years, you know, is going to affect their basic stability. Um, in the last years, however, I don't know what number of years, but um, private equity, probably since 08, 2008 with the crash, private equity has really become bigger and bigger and bigger, especially in our industry. So right now in the United States, one third of all hotel rooms are owned by private equity. So that's our bosses, private equity that we have to fight. And uh, the other thing that private equity has done has specifically, like they've acted differently after 08. Instead of just buying all, uh, up a lot of houses and then flipping them, making their profit and moving on, they've helped, they've kept the houses. So they're actually a very huge um, uh, homeowner in Southern California especially. Um, and then the rise of short-term rental and sort of like this new gig economy, I guess it falls under and where uh, entire apartment buildings are being emptied and essentially illegal hotels being run, you know, by having apartment buildings run like, you know, Airbnb wow. in and out. And so, uh, so, you know, there's a shrinking market of places to live. The prices for homes owned by private equity, they don't want chump change, they want real money. So the rents are much higher. Um, so a lot of workers are, you know, similar to what Billy is saying, they're forced out two hours away and that's a ter you know, obviously a terrible quality of life, um, but you know, we're getting squeezed on both ends because our owners are private equity. And so they are, and they're, they're, no, they're no joke. You know, Blackstone is the biggest private equity company worth $1 trillion, so worth more than most countries' economies. And so we are, bat so people, regular people are battling huge capital like we've never seen before, and that's, of course, proven by the fact that there are so many billionaires. You don't, become, you don't get billionaires by not squeezing someone, right? You've, you're squeezing all the way down the line. And so it's here to stay and getting worse, I think. Kent, some thoughts about what organized labor... I mean, you know, if you think back in history, um, we often say that organized labor in the post-World War II period created the American middle class with high wages and the ability to own a home, and that certainly is part of the so-called California dream. Um, what is organized labor, what can organized labor do uh, to counteract this kind of trend that we're, we're just talking about here? This whole wave of strikes and worker organizing represents the hopes 
and aspirations of millions of working people here in Southern California um, and throughout the state. And um, I think we have a moment now where we have this extraordinary alignment. A few weeks ago, the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor uh, mobilized the very first summit on poverty and homelessness. And they celebrated all of the extraordinary workers' struggles that are fighting for a living wage, that are fighting for the right to be able to live and work in Los Angeles, which is currently inaccessible for millions of working people. And um, it is great now that we have the mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bass, who has courageously thrown down on the issue of homelessness, declared a state of emergency in her first day in office, followed by the County Board of Supervisors, who have thrown down and declared a state of emergency on homelessness in the County of Los Angeles, followed by the city of uh, Long Beach and the mayor of Long Beach. So now we have this alignment that is really addressing this horrendous dilemma of tens of thousands of unhoused people, the vast majority black and Latino people who um, have no place to live, have no place to go, and hundreds of thousands of more who are housing insecure. So this is a, a consequence of the extreme economic inequality, the extreme corporate greed that even during the pandemic was raking in massive profits, and even the government bailouts that went to support worker retention were being pocketed by corporations and uh, shareholders uh, when they should have been going to the workers. So this is the reality that we are facing today. And that's why I think it is so significant that the LA labor movement is stepping up and uh, challenging uh, economic inequality, greed, uh, and uh, calling for the abolishment of poverty and the abolishment of homelessness. Can I just amplify that really quick? Um, okay. In the same way that we were saying, when the Writers Guild makes a proposal, it's not just something that's good for writers, it's good for the business in general. Unions are not just good for unions. Unions are good for the country. Um, what are the four ways that you can check unchecked corporate greed? There are only four. There's consumer protest, almost never happens. There's stockholder protest, which really never happens. There's government regulation, not likely as long as Mike Johnson is swinging a gavel. That's not going to happen. And then you have strikes. That's it. We are the only defense against unchecked corporate greed. And what you know about unions, statistically, and forgive me for saying this in your presence, because this is very much your bailiwick, but where, un where unions are, yes, the middle class thrives. People are paid more, they're healthier, they live longer, they vote more often, they volunteer more hours in schools, and they spend more time in religious services. Other than that, they don't do a damn thing to contribute to, the, to their society. Where unions go, you have a thicker democracy. And it is essential for the betterment of the country. And that's why, again, unions are not just for the benefit of people who are in unions. They make the country better. And it is in all of our best interests that unions thrive. Well, I just wanted to say that I consider it my job as a union president. Uh, I think I should be radical. And because we, we need, there are terrible things happening. I mean, people who work full time living in their cars. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? And so, uh, so when I, so when I, one a couple of the things that we're doing is I described private equity, where private equity, this is the craziest thing, where they get a lot of their money, is from public pension funds. So teachers, county workers, city workers. So all the people who you know pushed really hard in their unions to win a pension, it goes into a big giant trust. And then uh, the trust has to make money, of course, to you know keep the pension going. And so they go to the people who give them some of the biggest returns. They go to private equity. So right now, private equity is going to pension funds and saying, "I'll get you, you know, X percent, 13 percent, much higher than a lot of investments." And so we're getting in the way of that. We are going to the unions, the unions of record, the city unions, the teachers, and saying, "Well, look what's happening here." And the private equity companies are literally have no rules put upon them. So, and they will do anything to get money. So to give you a good example, um, in this last year, Blackstone uh, invested, bought, sorry, bought a big meat processing company 
where they were found to have 100 children working, cleaning the, the machinery um, in the meat processing plant. So uh, California fined them, but that's where they'll go. They'll probably go worse than that, actually. And so that's one thing that my local is doing, getting in the way of their money source. Another thing you may have heard about, it was extremely controversial. We got a lot of shit for it, honestly. And that is um, putting forth a ballot initiative where we got individual voters to, uh, to agree with a ballot initiative that would go to the larger vote, like in, in March of 24, where empty hotel rooms um, would be subject to homeless people living there who had a voucher to go to an empty room. And everybody went crazy, the left, the right, the middle, everybody. But, and then there were other things involved in that. That's a radical idea. Uh, actually, the city council of Los Angeles is now taking that and codifying something a little watered down, but that will you know, add a lot of rights for housing. So for example, replacing every time a developer knocks down housing, he has to replace it one for one. You know, a lot, a lot of other things. And so, but without having the radical idea and taking a lot of crap for it, honestly, um, that wouldn't be in front of the LA City Council. Um, another thing is um, living wage ordinances. You know, that's a more common thing, but we're starting at 25 an hour and going a dollar a year uh, every year till it hits 30. That's a big number. That's bigger than any number in the country. But guess what? The housing is bigger than all the rents in the country, too. So that's, I feel like that's my job as a union leader, and so my local union is doing all that stuff. It's sort of like um, we're kind of getting uppity about it <laughs> because you know we're like thinking through bigger ideas, but that's what we should do. That's really interesting. I just want to follow up on that idea. Um, the, all the different ways that the Unite Here is sort of engaging with the political sphere and different things. It's very different than what I think many people may think labor unions do may, from an older era, you know, where they organize, they negotiate contracts, they collect dues, things like that, um, based on, you know, labor law that was written in the 30s and 40s for the most part. But labor law hasn't changed federal labor law hasn't been updated uh, for decades in the United States. And it used to be that that was a major demand of organized labor was to change labor law. So um, is that whole idea like, you know, is it a chicken and egg question? You know, do you need to change labor law before unions can effectively organize? Or um, are those labor laws no longer relevant because they're so uh, outdated, you just do what you need to do. I don't know. Well, I'm a lawyer who <laughs> yes, became two an lawyers organizer. on the panel. So. Okay, so <laughs> my belief is that it's the organizing that changes the law, not the other way around. And so, uh, so that's why we're, you know, in the streets. That's we are also in the political arena, also trying to move policy. But we're not going to move. We're not. We wouldn't have moved that policy had we not been on strike. I think. And so just because the LA City Council would have not as much, you know, fire under their own uh, chairs. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah. that's my feeling. Kent, you want to see, you're a, you're a labor lawyer, or you have worked as a labor lawyer. You know, what's, what's your take on American labor law, and uh, can, it be, can it be salvaged, or um, should we just scrap it and start new? So there is an extraordinary lack of democracy within the U.S. workplace. The labor laws were written by and for corporations, and they have effectively blocked the fundamental and basic right of uh, workers to form and join unions. Uh, pro sentiment around pro union sentiment is at a 50 year high. Young people support unions by over 80 percent. And the vast majority of workers in the country, if given the opportunity, would join a union today. And yet, union density is around 10 to 11 percent in the country, 6 percent in the private sector. So how could there be such a massive disconnect between what workers want and, workers can, and what workers can get at the workplace? It is because of 
the bankrupt labor laws written by and for corporations, and the failure of labor law reform has been a bipartisan failure. It has not been a priority as much as Joe Biden says that he's the most pro-union president in history. If that's true, that's a scary thought. Um, but fundamentally, you know, Joe Biden has never seen a Pentagon budget that he doesn't love and uh, has done very little. You know, economic and racial inequality grew under eight years of Obama and Biden and economic and racial inequality has grown under the pandemic. And even in the state of California, although we have super majorities of Democrats in the Assembly and Senate, and every single statewide office is held by a Democrat, economic and racial inequality grew under the three years of the pandemic. What's wrong with this picture? It is a bankrupt, pro-corporate government that has effectively undermined the basic right of workers within our society to form and join unions. So you've got, since 1980, <laughs> since 1980, $50 trillion moving in the United States economy from the bottom 90% to the richest 1%. $50 trillion. Uh, the greatest migration of wealth in, in human history happened under Democratic presidents and Republican presidents, and it's a result of stock buybacks and uh, laws written by lobbyists and sometimes just outright corruption. And I think where it's left the American worker and the American citizen is with this idea that our government is designed to keep that richest 1% as rich as possible. And it's hard to argue that point based it's on... true. Oh, there you go. Okay. So what is the bulwark against that? The bulwark against that is unions. That's it. I mean, like you got Sherrod Brown out there doing all he can to pass the PRO Act. But in, in a Senate that's 50-50, Sherrod's not going to be able to pass the PRO Act. Um, he's going to have a real struggle. And, you know, the filibuster's going to get in his way even if it gets to 51 or 52. Uh, so what you have essentially are, I don't know, in what percentage of unions are, uh, if you look at 50 states, there are like seven or eight states that seem kind of union friendly, really, um, which means that 42 or 43 are not. Um, yeah, that's going to be a combination of, of workers using their leverage and hopefully people voting in a different way um, so that the laws can change. They both have to happen uh, simultaneous to one another because unions are all America has at this point uh, to stand firm against this insane corporatization of America. In, in my business, um, you know, we're striking against eight companies, or we're striking against eight companies. Those eight companies create 95% of the media consumed by the world. That concentration of power is in eight hands, essentially. Does that sound like democracy to you? And they're not even the old studios with Jack Warner. These are now mega corporations it's a it is a problem. But is Billy pointed to another really critical issue, and that is the role of the labor movement in the political arena. And we see very scary public opinion polls that show Trump neck and neck, and in some instances leading in battleground states against Joe Biden in a potential 2024 rematch. The attacks on unions in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin were focused, calculated, and launched by corporate America with the intent to undermine union strength, but also to undermine union ability to exercise its political power in the electoral arena. And so it is those three states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, that flipped from Obama to Trump that gave him the electoral victory. So there is a direct correlation between corporate America's assault on unions and corporate America and the Republican right's assault on democracy. Just to underscore that, there were 6.2 million Americans who had voted for Obama and then voted for Trump. 6.2 million Americans, they're flip voters. 1.3 million of them in those three states. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. 1.3 million flip voters in those three states. So someone did a deep dive study to find out who those voters are. What, what made them do that? They, 
either they weren't racist in the first place because they had voted for Obama, or they put their racism aside to vote for Obama. But either way, they wound up eight years later voting for Trump. Here's what we found out about those 1.3 million voters in those three critical battleground states. On average, they work two and a half jobs. On average, they commute three hours a day. On average, they think about politics four minutes per week, per week. So Democrats show up thinking we're going to get them with an argument about the filibuster or the fucking debt ceiling. They don't care. They're not interested in that. It's got nothing to do with their lives. They're, these are people who I guarantee you they're taking their medication every other day to make 30 pills last 60 days. Their kids' school is falling apart. If they're lucky, their mom's in a nursing home. America consumes 80% of the opiates in the world, so toss that in there too. Like, you've got to talk to that worker in their language, and Democrats need to learn how to do that. Um, it's something that I talk to the candidates that I work with constantly about how to speak in the language of that worker who was able to be flipped, and it's exactly what you're talking about. So that's great. So um, I had a question which now I kind of know everybody's answer to, but I'm going to ask it anyway just to get the laugh line, which is that, you know, President Joe Biden um, was the first president to walk an active picket line recently when he went to the uh, UAW strike, and was that purely symbolic? Um, I guess um, maybe the answer, you, you would say yes. I would but, not. But, okay, well, we can follow yes. up on that. But what I, my follow-up then is... Um, for Susan, because you guys are talking about the various the, the macro political environment, and Unite here also is a has a in addition to being a union has a very active political um, organization, not just in California and Arizona, but in other parts of the the country. So, give us the perspective from from your union um, about what does it take to transform. The, the political field? Uh, well, we, what we really truly do is we take the organizing principles we use in the workplaces, which is organizing workers to you know, fight for their contracts or fight for a union. And, then, and that comes down to the question of what does the worker want in life? You know, what does that person care about? And so we take the same model. So you have to dig deep a little bit, right? Because most people, a lot of people don't even, can't even articulate that usually. Uh, so we take the similar model and then we ask that of voters, but we do that with workers. So worker to worker, similar to what Billy's just suggested. And so we have done that um, not only in our local area, and we, we represent workers in Arizona as well. So we decided to create a federal super PAC so that we would be able to play in the federal races. And so we did that in 2020 during the pandemic when we were not working at all. Uh, we took 550 people to Arizona and went door to door and had workers speaking to working people. And we were able to flip Arizona that way. And so we took the similar idea because Unite Here organizes similarly across the country and so we took those ideas to Pennsylvania. And so if people who know Pennsylvania really well know that in Philadelphia, you can flip the entire state because it's so dense. And so they did the same thing in Philadelphia uh, this, uh, and Nevada. And so this year, if, if people had seen the New York Times in the last couple of days, there's all this polling being done right now. And the six major battleground states, Nevada, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Georgia, um, are all pro-Trump now. And so we have a lot of work to do. It's nice and early, but it's pretty scary. And uh, we also similarly uh, went to Georgia uh, to help flip um, Os Ossoff and Warnock's races twice. Uh, but we also work locally. So we, Maria Elena Durasso, she used to be the president of Unite Here Local 11. She's now a California state senator. Uh, I know that Catherine Lieberger is running, right, from AFSCME, AFSCME right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she's, a form, she's a current union president. Um, we, Hugo Soto Martinez, who's a LA City Council person, he it was a lead organizer with us for about 12 years. Um, and we have a woman who is a 15-year organizer in Arizona who's on the Phoenix City Council. But uh, that's why I love LaFonza Butler, because even though 
I love Adam Schiff too. Um, you know, I really feel like, you know, she has union in her heart, which means that she's fighting for working people, period. And so uh, I think that's a really important part of changing things, that people have to not just want to say, oh yeah, I'm pro-union, but to be pro, you know, to from the inside be really pro-union. So then policy and ideas flow from that, from that leader. I really wanted to highlight and celebrate Susan Minato and Unite Here Local 11's extraordinary work. This is one of the most powerful stories of political transformation that is unknown by the vast majority of people in this country. That a relatively small union, the Hotel Workers Local 11, flipped the state of Arizona, flipped the state of Arizona with 550 activists who went door to door during the pandemic to turn Arizona from red to blue. And after they won the victory in November 2020 in Arizona, 1,300 hotel worker activists went to Georgia and mobilized 1 million households in Atlanta and the suburbs of Atlanta and flipped the two Senate seats, which changed the political makeup of the US Senate from red to blue. So if we had more unions like Local 11, we would be in a very, very different place in the country today. For sure. Yeah. All right. I love the interactivity here. Way to go. All right, so you know, I wanted to ask a question about big um, technological and social transformations. And, and since this is a history event, I have to, you know, I'm obliged to say something about history. Uh, and but unions have confronted technology many, many times. You know, Harry Bridges of the Longshore Union negotiated the introduction of containers. Auto workers and steel workers unions had to deal with the introduction of robots in the factories and higher technology. Often they didn't do that great of a job. But it, it's, it's a long-term thing. And, and there's an old saying, and Tony Mazaki, who was the head of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union, coined the term just transition to, to say that if we're going to have an economic transformation, in his case he was talking about away from uh, fossil fuels, if we're going to move towards a green economy, uh, it, we have to have that transition in which workers are represented and get the types of jobs that they need. So I guess a question I have for you, because we've really been um, digging deep into the injustice of our, of our current system, uh, and I think, you know, we've, you, I, I'm sure you agree we have to move beyond that. So what is this just transition? If we were going to have a just transition, what would that look like for working people and unions? Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I know that's a big topic, but, you know, in a few words, and I guess I'll start off with Billy because the, the question of AI and that technology is one that really is uh, at the center of the Writers Guild contract and of the SAG-AFTRA strike continuing even today. How will this new technology be rolled out and who will control it? So what's your sense of what does a just transition to this new, in your case, technological future of AI, what does that look like for workers? Okay, well, let me, let me just start with the story to provide a little bit of context about who we're always fighting against. Um, there used to be a show on, on the Disney Channel called uh, Hannah Montana. And the creators of Hannah Montana, <laughs> the creators of Hannah Montana uh, had a clause in their contract that said that if any other exploitation of, um, of that show, a, a stage production or a, 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 a series of concerts, etc., were to take place, that they were entitled to participate in some of the profits. So Hannah Montana goes out on a concert tour and makes a zillion dollars. And the creators of the show go to Disney and they say, look, we have this contract that says that if any of our characters, uh, that if our characters go out on and, and exploit uh, some other revenue stream, we are entitled to a part of that. At Disney said, yes, characters, with an S, head of Montana's one character. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. 
and Disney won. That's a $30, $40 million difference to those writers. So with that as a contextual background, do I want AI in the hands of people who make that kind of decision? No. No, I don't. That doesn't sound good for writers. It doesn't sound good for the product. It doesn't sound good for the consumer. It doesn't sound good for anybody. So the well, big... It sounds great for Disney. So the big thing for us was who is going to be in, in control of this awesome force. Um, on my podcast, I interviewed AI twice. Literally had it set up so that there was a, a text to voice mechanism um, and asked AI a bunch of questions. Um, do you think that you could be a teacher? Yes. Do you think you could be a cop? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever listened to my podcast before? No. Do you think now having been on my show that you could host it? Yes. Do you think you could write a movie? Absolutely. Like it just kept going on and on and on. Um, that technology is not a tool in the hands of people who will exploit it. And so we felt very strongly that writers could not be subjected to that. Kent, you want to say something about the auto workers and the green transition? What that, what's at stake there? Unfortunately, just transitions for millions and millions of working people in this country has been a myth. There has been no just transition. Uh, during a period of massive deindustrialization, uh, plant shutdowns, capital flight, uh, U.S. corporations shut down profitable factories in the United States to relocate to the South, to uh, the developing world, to exploit workers, to exploit natural resources, and to maximize profits. And so for those millions and millions of factory workers who had solid union jobs that paid a middle-class income and that allowed them to buy homes and raise their kids and take vacations, that life is gone. And so uh, nothing took the place of those jobs but for Walmart and flipping burgers. That was the replacement that um, led to massive dislocation of uh, the economy. So we have actually a very interesting situation now where the largest group of auto workers in the Western United States are right here at the University of California campus. 48,000 UAW members launched the longest and largest strike in the history of higher education. And in my view, these 48,000 recently organized strike leaders uh, are going to have a huge impact on the California labor movement and on the US labor movement. Because in the coming years, they're going to be entering the workforce and will be bringing that union consciousness with them. So, What's interesting is that the UAW graduate students played a critical role in supporting their sisters and brothers against the big three auto corporations. They were able to provide a lot of research skills, a lot of media and social media skills to advance the cause of auto workers. And what's interesting is that in many ways, the United Auto Workers organizing here within the campus was a 10-year battle because of the fierce anti-union animus of this administration. And the reality is that the success of these 48,000 graduate students put to shame the faculty within the University of California who are hopelessly unorganized. We have community colleges in the state of California, 100% union. Every single community college, 100% union. California State University, the faculty are 80% unionized because they see the power and the importance of collective action and working together. The University of California faculty are hopelessly unorganized, don't understand union consciousness, and in many ways have supported the corporatization of the university. So a case in point was when political scientists gathered from throughout the country and scabbed on the Unite Here strike, crossing picket lines because they have the right to do so, and it was a really black mark against uh, faculty who should know better, who should respect union picket lines and should not scab on other workers. I just want to say one of the things that feels different about the union movement to me now, which is in direct contrast to what you're just saying, I feel like every union member that's on strike is now feeling a kinship with other union members on strike, um, even though they're not in the same 
industries anymore. There seems to be this very zeitgeisty thing that's happening now. I, I felt tremendous affinity when I was walking around in circles with a stick on my shoulder. I felt tremendous uh, uh, affinity with any other union member, whether they were on strike or not, and they clearly felt it with us. SAG walked out partially as a, as a support mechanism for our strike, and you know, next July when the Teamsters and IATSE go in to negotiate their deal, who knows what, what's going to happen to my town, but I know that the Writers Guild and, and SAG will be behind those two unions. Susan? Maybe you could close us out on a, a thought about solidarity, and it does seem true that over the last summer, we've seen more working people showing up to each other's picket lines, more people conscious of solidarity. I mean, what's changing in America and among working people, uh, and what does it bode for the future? Uh, I, well, I've been in the labor movement for about 35 years, and though we have often said we are in solidarity with each other, unions, and we have been in general. Uh, we haven't had quite the same level of commitment to each other, I think. And I think part of it is that most people are in the same boat. Like the workers are screwed. And, you know, like the writers and the screen actors who have a, you know, certain veneer about who a lot of people think a lot of rich people are in those two unions, right? And then I think it's something like, I don't know, he knows the figures, but 80% of the people are like, you know, truly like, starving and so that's like our workers there our workers are working full-time and starving and so I think that's you know really uh, I found I heard that it, oh, actually the auto workers right there's a whole I think entry level before the strike was 18 or 19 dollars like most people have in their minds that auto workers make 35 40 bucks right something like that in the beginning and so I think that we just have a lot more in common but because we're suffering similarly. But capital is huger. It just is much bigger, and they got that way, you know, by squeezing the people. And so I think we're all experiencing a similar thing, and I, I really fear, you know, I'm really afraid for the country, because I feel like, you know, it is moving so far in favor of capital and Trump and people like this that want to take away any form of democracy that we have, you know, strived for for many years, or 200 years or more. Um, and I, so, uh, I mean, I, I really, I'm, I wasn't joking when I say that, you know, our job is to be radical. And it's to be radical and to get you all to participate, you know, in all kinds of ways. Um, and so, going door to door, um, I bet you that every person in this room would be amazing at the doors, you know, in Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, any of these places. And so, uh, so I think, you know, I think people have to realize that we have to actually do something. We can't just think about it and support on the sides. I just so, want to say, we started five minutes late, so I'm going to keep going. Um, I got a lot of shit. These labor people, they're uncontrollable. No, I am uncontrolled. I, I, I'm very hard to control about this because I care about my country and I think this is, this is, such, a, this is such an if A then B proposition. I, I want to underscore what you were saying. Um, yes, in my guild, uh, there's this insane idea out there that all writers are wealthy, which of course is not true, but specifically in SAG. To qualify for health benefits in SAG, an actor needs to make $21,470 in a year. $21,470, which, as all of you know, is enough money to starve to death in Los Angeles. No one's living in Los Angeles on $21,470. In the year 2022, the percentage of SAG members, working actors, who got to that number, 12.7% of that union. 87.3% of that union's membership did not clear $21,470. And I personally, on my show, spoke to an actress who had booked 13 jobs in 2022 and didn't get to the 21,000 number because wages had been so badly suppressed by the streamers. Of course they went on strike. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they go on strike? So when we talk about what does unionization and what does labor do for America, you know, there's the famous story about Walter Ruther, president of the UAW, and Henry Ford II. They were touring a, a Ford plant in Cleveland in 1954, and they passed on the line a place where robots were doing the work that uh, human beings had done just a year before. 
and Henry II, noted prick that he was, said, hey, Walter, how are you going to get uh, union dues out of those workers? And, and Walter Ruther said, I wonder how many of them are going to buy Fords. <laughs> and that's the point. That's the point. What is good for unions is good for America. And if you walk through the halls of Congress right now, you will see that now that Republicans are in charge of the House of Representatives, the Labor Committee isn't even called the Labor Committee anymore. It's called the Workforce Committee. There is such an incredible contempt for the concept of labor. They won't even put the name in the committee anymore. It's the Workforce Committee. Fellas, you got to vote with. You got to vote on this. You got to get those bums out if you want unions and therefore America to have a chance. Just one more note on solidarity. <laughs> Please. The screenwriters and the actors launched a strike together for the first time since 1960. In March of this year, for the first time in history, the United Teachers of Los Angeles struck in solidarity with the classified workers of the LA Unified School District. They won between a 21 and 30% wage increase. I have been so inspired. I got arrested with 200 people at the uh, hotel workers' uh, uh, civil disobedience action blocking the LA airport. Um, and I am so inspired by the thousands and thousands of people who have stood in solidarity with the ho hotel workers who are making poverty wages, cleaning 14, 15 rooms a day, and making poverty wages. 70-year-old housekeepers who can't retire because there's no pension for hotel workers under their contract. So this is the solidarity that is growing. This is the solidarity that is reflected in the 300 labor studies students that take my class every fall and the young workers themselves talking about the exploitation and abuse they face in the jobs that cater and rip off young workers. So this is the reality of the workplace in America today and it is an exciting time to grow and build union solidarity. Yeah. Woo. All right. Well, I don't know any better way to finish it off than that, folks. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I want to thank Susan Minato, Billy Ray, and Kent Wong. Thanks to the History Department, and uh, I believe there is a reception. There is a reception on the patio, so please join us. Yeah, take it in.